Hey everyone, and welcome back to Don't Open That Door. I am Justin, the Magi Apprentice. I'm Nico, and uh, boy howdy, I'm glad we're reviewing this movie instead of The Daddy. And I'm Dan, uh, the Explorer. <laughs> wow. That's the best one you've I ever had. I told you it was bad. <laughs> so we are here today to discuss The Mummy, the 1999 version with Brendan Fraser. So this was directed by Stephen Summers, and we've got the aforementioned Brendan Fraser as Rick O'Connell, Rachel Weisz as Evelyn Carnahan, John Hanna as Jonathan Carnahan. That was probably difficult, John Jonathan. We've got Arnold <laughs> Vosloo as Imhotep and Kevin J. O'Connor as Benny. So this movie opens with Imhotep. He's basically an ancient Egyptian priest, and he's kind of just doing his thing. Unfortunately, it turns out that Imhotep was actually getting it on with the Pharaoh's mistress, Anaxunamun. Now, they're kind of doing their thing, and things are good for a while, but eventually the pharaoh gets hip and confronts them. Unfortunately for the pharaoh, he's then killed by Imhotep. Unfortunately for Imhotep, though, he's surrounded by the guards. Anaxunamun stays behind, eventually killing herself, and Imhotep kind of flees, promising that he will resurrect her. He tries to later, but it doesn't really work out because he's interrupted by the magi, who were the, the pharaoh's like special guard. And Imhotep is mummified and cursed. If he is ever released, he will unleash an unholy plague upon the world and like bring about all these like plagues and whatnot. But that's only if he gets released, which I'm sure won't happen. Right, Nico? Yeah, no, definitely not. So what happens after that? So after that, well, we jump to 1923 and see our hero, Rick O'Fucking Connell, an American in the French Foreign Legion for some reason <laughs> and he's fighting alongside his friend benny against the magi an ancient warrior group o'connell's legion is defeated but he manages to escape into the desert and we flash forward to 1926 three years later and we meet evie a librarian and egyptologist along with her brother jonathan jonathan presents evie with an artifact that he acquired you can hear the air quotes there and evie opens it and they all die and the movie's over it's no but evie opens it and believes that it contains a map to the ancient city of hamanoptra but the map is partially destroyed and they need to find a, a way to get there all right dan so what is the way to get there so they end up enlisting o'connell who is being held in a local prison they barter to release him and he leads them to hamanoptra on the way, they find that Benny, who also managed to escape the Magi, is also leading a group of Americans to Hamanoptra. The two groups are ambushed, but they eventually make it to Hamanoptra. When they arrive, the Americans locate a box that warns of death coming to any who open it. But, you know, they decide to do so anyways, and they locate the Book of the Dead and some canopic jars, or jars of people's organs. Evie's group discovers a sarcophagus, which they open using Jonathan's artifact. Now, later on that night, Evie steals the Book of the Dead and reads aloud from it. Turns out this was a pretty critical mistake. By doing so, she awakens Imhotep, who was actually the mummy from inside that sarcophagus, shock and awe. Imhotep starts attacking one of the men who opened the canopic box, and he literally sucks him dry. Or he starts to, at least. He's interrupted by Evie, whom he refers to as Anaxanamun, or his love, and O'Connell and Jonathan show up to get Evie out of there. On their way out of the city, they meet Ardeth, a Magi warrior, and he explains to them kind of the unholy terror that they've just unleashed upon the land. Now, I mean, that's kind of a problem, but it gets bigger, doesn't it? Definitely. Wait, wait, wait. So the group flees back to Cairo and are pursued by Imhotep, who has enlisted the aid of Benny. Imhotep needs to suck out all of the men who open the canopic box, at which point he will become fully immortal and unstoppable. Then he will sacrifice Evie to bring back his own love, Aksunamon. Despite the best efforts of O'Connell, Evie, Jonathan, and Ardeth, Imhotep succeeds in draining all of the Americans who opened the box. Evie theorizes that if the Book of the Dead brought Imhotep back, then maybe the Book of Life should be able to kill him instead. She discovers that the Book of Life was also buried at Hamanoptra, but is kidnapped by Imhotep, who takes her back there to begin the sacrifice. Okay, so it looks like we got to have a final showdown in Hamanoptra. How's that go, Nico? So things go pretty well for them, all in all. 
most of them anyway. O'Connell, Jonathan, and Ardith make their way back to Hamanoptera and they fight off Imhotep's undead legion of priests as they are at the same time trying to find the Book of Life. Thankfully, they succeed and they find it and Evie manages to read from it, stripping Imhotep of his immortality. Once this happens, O'Connell stabs him through with a scimitar, killing him once again. And the movie ends with our heroes riding off into the sunset with a pretty nice amount of treasure from Hamanoptera on the backs of some camels. The end. Well, that's pretty nice. So... We got to take this one down to brass tacks. Let's talk through it. So, Dan, visuals. How does this movie look? You know, considering this came out in, you know, 99, how's this movie look? So this movie looks actually pretty good. I thought a lot of the special effects were pretty good. No, it does look a little dated. It looks like special effects from the, you know, late 90s. But, I mean, all things considered, like, I didn't think any of it looked, like, cheesy bad or anything like that. Like, really badly outdated well, a lot of the special effects were actually cool, too. And even though you could tell their special effects, you know, looking back at it now, they were still just cool. And the ideas and the creativeness in them were just fucking cool. And I kind of wish I could see this exact movie with, like, today's special effects. And not, like, a remake of this movie, but, I mean, like, this exact movie, just special effects <laughs> yeah. of today. But, no, I mean, overall, I thought it looked pretty good. Agreed. I kind of feel like probably the worst of the special effects is when Imhotep is kind of still in his... Because he goes through phases to get from the mummy mm -hmm. to, like, getting his flesh and blood back when he finishes draining all the Americans. The initial, like, couple phases when he's clearly, like, a CGI monster, those are probably the worst looking, and they don't even look that bad. You can tell it's like, yeah, that's a special effect on well, it. You know, I was actually reading that um, that's, like, half special effects and half not. Because like yeah, because yeah, they did film him and everything, and they used like <laughs> they fucking killed him. <laughs> yeah, that too. No, but they used like all the like tracking stuff, lasers on his face to kind of be able to track that and replace parts of it. So like when you see half of his mouth like hanging open, like that's actually him, and they just CG'd that part. And which I guess yeah. today is probably you know fairly standard practice, but I think back in the '90s it was I wouldn't quite say revolutionary, but. Not as common anyways. Yeah, so there's definitely that. And my boy Imhotep loves to put his face in some sand, <laughs> or rather make sand in the image of his face. Because, you know, there's the start of the movie, we kind of get some foreshadowing when, you know, we end up seeing Imhotep's face in the sand when O'Connell is there at the start in Hominoptera fighting off the Magi. And then, you know, towards the end, we get the classic, you know, the Imhotep creating a sandstorm and his the face appears death. in a sandstorm <laughs> yeah. to like get them down. And that's an awesome scene and it's still fucking awesome to this mm -hmm. day. I still think it's really, really, really cool. Nico, how'd you take the visuals? Particularly maybe the set design. Yeah, no, I love the set design. Everything looked fantastic when they were in the tombs and just going back and forth between like Cairo and the city of Hamanoptera. It all looks just majestic as fuck it is a absolutely breathtaking set of scenes that they've got there especially in 1999 like you were both saying part of it you can tell that it was in 99 but for the most part i feel like the special effects in general combined with the scenery make for something that is greater than the sum of its parts if you will like they don't go too heavy on any kind of full screen effects or anything the only time that they have stuff really really flashy is during the the part with like the big old sandstorm that looks fantastic just because it's a wall of sand and similarly with a sort of like specters that are floating up from an woman's grave into her corpse kind of like trying to possess her that looks cool because they were not trying to go over the top if you know what i mean and also one last thing everyone in this movie is so fucking attractive oh my god just everyone is, is so fucking hot in this movie. <laughs> i wasn't gonna bring it up but you did but at the very start, when you see a Nox on a moon, I was mm -hmm. like, God damn, what? Right? I did not remember that outfit as a child. <laughs> outfit? It's body paint, actually. <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah. Outfit. I don't remember that. And I was like, God damn. Yeah. But, eh. So we're going to go ahead now and um, let's talk a little bit about the audio here. You know, 
How did you feel about it? There's some real classic, classic tunes in this one. At least for me, it felt like it was perfect. The score was kind of very much what you would almost kind of stereotype a kind of adventure, adventurous theme mm-hmm. to be. You know what I mean? And I personally really, really like it a ton. How do you feel? I liked it quite a bit. It was the film in general very much has Indiana Jones vibes to it. And the music is with there as well, I think. It just has, like you said, that adventure soundtrack to it. And then when they're in Cairo and in the cities and things like that, not exploring the ruins, you get sort of the stereotypical Egyptian kind of music as well. Except was fucking the, uh, that one like pilot dude, was he listening to some like Latin shit or something? Or am yeah, I, I wasn't tripping? sure about that. I feel like he was listening to some Latin, so I don't know where that came from. He had Daddy Yankee blasting in the earphones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, and I thought a lot of like the Foley and stuff was pretty good too. Sometimes a little heavy handed. I thought sometimes you like, you know, the sound effects were a little much, but I don't know. Overall, it helped accentuate the action and the combat and whatnot. So I thought it was fairly well done. All right. All right. All right. Nico, your thoughts on the on the noises that came out of this one? So I really, really like this one, particularly as a kind of like a juxtapose between the other films that we review here on the podcast, where most of the time in horror movies, the sound is kind of like window dressing to set the scene and add to the sort of like texture of scares and stuff. But in this, we have actual like themes and motifs, like when there is development between Evie and Rick O'Connell, they have their love theme that plays. And when there is like a, a big escape and they get out of danger and just in the nick of time, they have a, you know, an adventure theme that plays. And just like you said, Dan, it has a very definite sort of influence from Indiana Jones, but it works. It's not cheesy. And the writers knew what they were doing. Agreed, agreed, agreed. So we ask this question a lot, but if you were, I should say, a listener of the pod, asked us to bring this to the forefront, which I think we would have done so anyways. But is this one horror? So everyone get ready, you know, grab your familiar weapon. And let's talk through this. So first off, we're just going to go with the simple yes or no from the three of us. And then after we'll explain ourselves. Okay. So Nico, is this horror? Yes or no? Fuck, why'd you have to ask me first? Um, I, I don't know. I really don't know. This man, like, failed the prompt. I I know. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so Nico has got the fence, like, right up his ass. Dan, what do you, how do you feel about it? I'm going to say no. It's not horror. I'm going to say yes. I know you are. (laughs) So, So, in the past, you know, Nico and I, listeners of the pod will know, we've discussed about what, is horror to us what constitutes horror we and dan was also on that bonus episode too uh, i was there i was there I okay, okay 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 <laughs> i mean i mean generally generally nico you do have the most fire for this when it comes to me and like fair, particularly fair. those you know those films that shall not be named <laughs> when we discuss those we oftentimes debate you know Where's the line almost between drama and horror for some of those? So and this is more like action and horror. Mm-hmm. I want to hear you first, Dan. You the burden of proof is on you. Okay. Is it? What 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 makes this not horror? I'm playing, I'll say my piece too. But what makes this not horror? I mean, I don't think that it's a scary movie. Now I will say when I was young, the first time I saw it, back I didn't see it in well, maybe I did see it in probably like 2000, 2001, probably after theaters, like not in theaters, but it scared the shit out of me, but I don't think that it's a scary movie. There's not a lot of tension. There's not dread. There's not, there's just not those kind of themes and things that make it horror to me. There's too much comedy, too much, I don't quite want to say too much action, but it's an action movie with comedy and romance thrown in there. See, my thought process is that I call it a horror movie because To borrow a a turn of phrase here, I think it uses some of the familiar trappings of horror. And this, to me, is kind of almost used to elicit that response for like big chunks of the movie. When they are at Hominoptera and they're in the tombs, 
really horrific stuff happens. This character who's referred to as the warden, he was O'Connell's prison warden. He gets like a scarab stuck inside of him. It's almost kind of like body horror. There is like straight up body horror. Yeah. When we watch it, like climb up inside of him later on, we get the same scene with Jonathan who has that happen to him. And like, you know, O'Connell has to like stab him with the knife and pull out the scarab. We don't see him, the knife really go into him, but that's what he does. We see, you know, the mummy is meant to be kind of a scary creature, especially at the start. That's kind of what happens. And people talk about how horrific this is. He unleashes plagues upon the land. I think there is, and so this is kind of the dividing line where, you know, did the movie set out to scare you? I think for parts of it, yes, it did. And I think there are other parts where definitely not. You know, there's parts where it's funny. There's parts that are more action heavy. And I feel like it's not a pure horror movie. I would never call it a pure horror movie. But I think there's enough horror there to call this kind of a blend of almost like the action and horror genres a little bit. Because I feel like real talk, we've looked at a lot of movies that are, you know, they're very dramatic style horror movies and they still can walk away with being called a horror movie. So I don't see why this one can't just because it blends some other genres in as well. I... I understand what you're saying, but I don't agree. I think that similar to conversations we had about, you know, deathgasm and things like that, like, is it a comedy or is it a horror? Well, yes, they have comedy elements, but just because there are comedy elements does not make it a comedy movie. And I think it's all about the balance. And I think that this one does not have enough horror in it to be horror. I think Mm -hmm. that It's an adventure movie that, yes, has some horrific elements in it. But, I mean, Scooby-Doo is not really like horror. You know, we reviewed it. You know, we talked about it too. But it's not like a horror thing. It has definite horror elements, obviously. And there's like a lot of action adventure movies have horror elements in it because there's ancient things that are killing people or whatever. But I don't think that it's enough to be considered horror. Okay. Any thoughts, Nico? So I'm leaning both ways, actually. (laughs) 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 Shut up. I understand both of your perspectives, and I'm torn because it has a lot of, you know, like Justin said, to quote a phrase, a lot of the trappings of horror in it. It's got, you know, good use of body horror. It's got some good usages of dread, but I think it definitely falls more on the action adventure side of things. Having said that, this movie has a whole lot of, like, desiccated corpses and gore and, like, stuff. Well, not a whole lot of gore, but, like, Imhotep looks fucking scary. Imhotep looks dead-ass scary, like, He is just a mangling corpse, and you see every little detail. It's hard for me to not categorize that. Pirates of the Caribbean has skeletons and evil shit, and Harry Potter does, and, like, everything does. Well, not everything, obviously, but, like, a shit ton of things No, that's that's true. That's true. I think it is more solidly an action-adventure movie, but it, like... It dips its toe into horror. I think it's horrific at times, but I don't think I could call this a horror movie. Sorry, bro. Which toe is it dipping? The big toe? Uh, I was thinking more like the middle toe. Mm, The fuck you toe? The fuck you toe, yeah. (laughs) All right, well. First Laro toe, then Baro toe, then fuck you toe. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) Listen, I will leave this one for the streets to decide, okay? I'll go on social media and ask there. I still fuck with the movie, obviously. Oh, yeah, of course, the fuck. So I do want to also ask real quick, because we're talking about horror now, the villain in this movie is Imhotep, right? Can we agree on that? Yeah. But is he a bad guy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I agree. (laughs) Like, I see what you're getting at with he's just trying to be reunited with his woman. I get that. But he didn't have to do it like that, though. Actually, he did. They literally said that they cursed him and he was obliged to carry it out. I guess that's true. I feel like they could have just killed him straight up, just like stabbed him like, ah. Yeah, I don't know why they had to do all that shit. Yeah, you know what? (laughs) New talking point. Why the fuck would you curse somebody with that much power? 
<laughs> like there were so many ways that that could backfire and they all did they literally could have just yeah. like stabbed him and it would have been done why would you roll those dice there's no reason to roll those dice yeah i forget what the name of the actual ritual was they did but like his followers they mummified them alive and that looked painful enough mm -hmm. as is like fucking right i was like that that seems to be a punishment that's just fine you didn't have to do the hun i forget what it was called there was something like remember. that but the ritual that they did to him i was like so you granted him all this power if he was ever released and you're just gonna leave that up to chance that he's never gonna be released like come on y'all yeah. like we can probably do better but i'm question marked on emotep and his status because i guess he he literally had to he was obliged to carry out those plagues he didn't have a choice in the matter they said he had to so yeah i guess he's not really a bad guy then i mean no he, he definitely still is but <laughs> i mean we'll see because he also is true to his word he doesn't lie Except for the part where he says, you know, I'll spare your friends and then tells the mob, kill them. Well, he did spare them. He never attacked them. Yeah, he did. That was the mob. Nah, he tries to kill the main Bruh. characters in the sandstorm. Bruh. Quite deliberately. Well, okay, but that was after they pursued him. That's the same argument as guns don't kill people. It's actually the bullets that kill people. I'm saying we got to take another look at Imhotep. I'll defend this man in court. We'll come out one way or the other. He says like five things in the whole movie and like at least one of them is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good KD record. So I also got to ask, so we have Benny, right? And Benny is kind of a chicken shit. So, you know, we kind of get a really awesome scene with Benny where Imhotep's coming after him and Benny starts praying to like all the gods. He does like Christianity he says something, you know, Islamic. He does, I don't know. There's one that it literally says he was just saying gibberish. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it was. But then he ends up swapping over to Judaism, which Imhotep recognizes. And, you know, he speaks Hebrew, I should say. And it's, it's just kind of funny because we joke around sometimes on this podcast about, you know, against ghosts or spirits. Like The religion is like Pokemon typing. You just got to pick the one that's super effective. And... I guess he, he picked the one that Imhotep was like, wait, like, and I think it's funny because it's not that Imhotep thinks he's like good or anything. That's just the only person Imhotep's heard speak a language that he understands. Like, yeah. Imhotep yeah. doesn't understand anyone. So I think it's pretty funny. Also, I thought it was also pretty cool that Evie never communicated with Imhotep in, um, you know, any kind of ancient language, despite the fact that she obviously understood it and knew how to mm. do it. She just like purposely didn't. Yeah. To like make things more difficult for him, which I thought was pretty funny as well. Actually, yeah, that's a nice little power play. Yeah, but Benny, do you guys consider him to be a villain? Because at first he's kind of compelled at the threat of his life, but then afterwards we kind of see him doing things that, I mean, Imhotep's not even there, and he's still like doing things that Imhotep would want him to do. So is Benny a villain as well? I think he's a fuck. Yeah. I don't know about a villain. I think he's a villain. I think he's one of the like comedic villains who's there to be like the hunchman isn't quite the right word but he's like the fool archetype yeah comedic relief but i think he's a villain because even before before he runs in with imhotep he's kind of portrayed to be sort of the maybe not villain but like rival slash antagonist kind of and last but not least ardeth the magi how do you guys feel about his character is he entirely necessary? How, what role does he fulfill, Nico? I think he is kind of a stand-in, well, not stand-in, but he is you know, a little representation of the forces that were trying to prevent all of this from happening. And I think his character was necessary. If he wasn't there, then we would have just had this unknown force of people who were trying to stop everything for some reason and i mean yes part of that makes it that his character is a bit of an exposition dump but it's never it's not a lot yeah i think he's necessary i think he's a badass too dan thoughts on on Ardith? i agree with a lot of what nico said though i i wouldn't quite say he's necessary he's not unwelcome like i thought he was a cool character and i i'm glad that he was there but 
I think you could have taken him out of the movie and still been able to do everything fairly effectively. Yeah, I was going to say that in that final fight, if he wasn't there, they could have just as easily gone with Winston and Winston could have like died fighting the mummies in the Lost City Mm -hmm. instead of on the plane, which doesn't really matter. But I want to turn our attention now to, you know, a topic near and dear to Nico's heart, insects. So one of the most iconic things in this movie is the scarabs. Now, they're... They come and go. They're more present at the start, you know, when they first get to the Lost City. And, I mean, these scarabs are voracious. Like, if they land on someone, they just, like, devour them, apparently. So I did some research, and scarabs aren't like that, actually. Oh? In real life. They're like scavengers. They don't actively kill things like that, I don't Mm. think. But secondly... Thank God! Yeah, they made them like land piranhas, basically. But... I want to know, how do you guys feel about the scarabs? And do you think they're like an iconic kind of monster in this movie, almost? I mean, first off, they apparently have a very long lifespan because they were down there for like thousands of years, Mm -hmm. particularly the ones that were like encrusted in jewels or something like that. And then they pop out. I mean, Nico, how do you feel about the scarabs? I think the thing with that was like once they touch sand, they come alive. I don't know if that's the way it actually was because we don't get an like an in movie explanation, but I that was kind of how I understood it. But yeah, no, those things are fucking terrifying to me. And <laughs> as someone with, as I've mentioned multiple times here, I have a phobia of insects. I learned a couple of years back that the tickle ticklish response is a sort of innate biological response as a way to sort of get you to get bugs off of you because it makes you think that there are bugs crawling on you when there's like you feel that something is tickling you. Fun Mm. fact, I'm also super ticklish, so I cannot imagine the hell that was going on whenever they were just burrowing into anyone's skin. And given how that just... What a fucking way to go. What a fucking way to go. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. That is definitely true. But I want to get your take on it, Dan. How do you feel about the scarabs? Are they iconic? I think so. I love the scarabs in this film. I mean, I think there's not a lot of other movies out there that, to me, that I've seen that really, like, do that or at least make as big of a deal out of them as this movie did. And it was cool that they were almost, like, mystical. Because, like you said, they last forever or, like, they're, like, gems. And then something activates them and they come alive. And I thought it brought a whole, like, cool ancient Egyptian mysticism sort of to it to the film and I don't know I I liked them all right all right all right I do agree as well that you know one thing I thought and I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt is that you know how they said Imhotep's kind of corpse was still like juicy Mm -hmm. I thought that maybe since the scarabs ate from his corpse and his flesh that's why they were given such long life because they consumed his, his flesh but Maybe. that actually wouldn't solve the ones that were, like, encrusted yeah. on the walls. True. But I thought it was a cool thought by me. Well, I mean, they probably reproduced and, you know. All right. They might not be the original OG scarabs from 3,000 years ago. I wonder if, like, they could subsist just by eating one another for 3,000 years. Oh. I bet they could. There were a lot of those motherfuckers. Yeah, wild. Maybe. But in any case, this is actually another chance for us to take a look at some actual mythology Cats. It's always cats in horror movies. And it's no different here, where we've got Imhotep being afraid of the cat. And I mean, Nico, how did you feel about them kind of embedding that kind of little bit of logic into the scenes? And I want to give you the context of, obviously, yes, you know, the cats being the symbol of, you know, the guardian of the underworld. I think that's what they said, right? And cats were, like, definitely highly praised in Egypt, ancient Egypt, and also, you know, in, like, modern, the Middle East, you know, cats are, like, OGs over there. So I want to know. Can you show me? There are two scenes. Well, I will. So there are two scenes where a cat kind of basically comes in to scare Imhotep away because otherwise he would have, like, basically won, you know? And a cat comes in to kind of scare him away. 
Now, from a purely writing perspective, do you view that as a cop out or do you think that's a, you know, standard or rather acceptable play? I think it's an acceptable play. I really do. I think that, for one, it's a good shout to the mythology, and it shows that the writers did their homework, at least for that part. I'm not going to go and say that the rest of this movie was, you know, accurate to the hieroglyphs in the pyramids or whatever, but I think it's good that they included that little bit of, you know, the culture in there, because you're right, that is something that appears not only in Egypt, but in multiple cultures across the world, and also, just given that this is a movie that balances, you know, comedy and action in it so well, it's just a nice little moment for us to see this, you know, terrifying creature who can turn his mouth like four feet long and just like groan and flies come out. And then someone holds up a cat just go like rare. And then he's like, oh, fuck. Like, that's that's a good for a laugh. Dan, your thought on the cat? Same. I echo everything Nico just said. Yeah. Thought All it was right. funny. Well, I feel like I didn't get enough from you there. I got to ask you a separate question now. So we kind of know the connotation of, you know, an American in movies today. If someone brings up like a stereotypical American, they're probably fat, probably, probably a little ignorant as well. Probably a lot ignorant, let's be real. (laughs) But, you know, this kind of, I almost feel like takes the kind of old school look at Americans because I mean... These guys are out to play rough. All the Americans in this are like, they have very similar characters. Dan, how do you feel about like just the American stereotype in this movie? I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, me too. Me the, too. <laughs> the four Americans, well, excluding Rick, the main character, the four other Americans are just like these like gun toting, like cowboy, the way that they shoot their guns or pistols are very like cowboy like. They love bourbon and, you know, there's just, they're just like American and like so many times throughout the film, the other characters will like make fun of them for being like so American. And I just thought it was fucking funny. (laughs) One of my favorite scenes is when they're on a boat that's attacked by the Magi and then all the Americans are like posted in the corner, like shooting all the, all the people. And Jonathan comes out and he goes, Americans. And then they like save him. They shoot Mm -hmm. a whole bunch of people and save him. He's like, Good show, lads. And I was just like, <laughs> yo, that's pretty fucking funny. But it is interesting. And, you know, Nico, I don't know if you can speak to this at all, but it's interesting to see kind of the evolution of the perception of Americans in media over time, kind of. Because you even go back, and it's not even, you know, that long ago, but you look at something like Tremors, you've got Burt Gummer. He is like a real American. He's got like his whole basement full of guns and he's ready for anything. I yeah. mean, it's interesting to see that change, isn't it, in media of just like what the standard American is. Yeah, I long for the days when that's what the rest of the world thought of us as. <laughs> like, I want to make America great again by making the world think of us like that instead of as these just mind-numbing fucking morons. Like, please, please, I would love to be a caricature from this movie. That'd be great. I mean, I kind of think that, like, it's almost like the stereotypes now are the older stereotypes, but in reality, in the sense that, like, what? yes, there's, you know, the older stereotype of Americans and guns. That stereotype, like, we still love our guns as a country, except yeah. now the stereotype is bad. Like, it's a negative yeah. version of that because we they have Agreed. so many mass killings and stuff, but, like... It's still America loves their guns. It's just not a good, funny thing anymore, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm honestly really reminded of Quincy Morris from Dracula. Just because in Dracula, you have all these like prim and proper European characters. And they're super, you know, they write in their journals and everything else. And then Quincy shows up and he's just like, yeehaw, y'all, I'm going to kill me a vampire today. (laughs) And just like... Listen, it's the most American thing. He kills Dracula with a Bowie, with, with not Bowie, a Bowie. How do you say it? B-O-W-I-E knife? Bowie oh, knife. Bowie knife. Bowie knife. Like, I'm yeah. sorry. I just lost like six America points. Doesn't he also use a kukri? <laughs> Doesn't he? A what? A kukri? K-U-K-R-I? I'm familiar with it, but a what? A kukri? Is it a cuckery? <laughs> Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's a kukri. No, bro, he's into kukri. No, that's... Nope. Nope. What is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? 
he kills him with the bee knife, okay? The bee knife? <laughs> and that's what he uses. Moving on. Fucking moving on. <laughs> so, trivia time. Trivia time is back again on DOTD, and it is hosted by our trivia master of lore, Delightful Dan. Dan, delight us with the deets. There's some pretty good ones on this film. Do you remember near the beginning of the movie-ish, Rick gets hanged? Yes. So yeah. apparently Brendan Fraser actually almost died in that scene. What? And <laughs> wow. Rachel Weiss remembers that Brendan Fraser actually stopped breathing and had to be resuscitated. <laughs> God damn. Yeah. Yo, yeah. I knew I liked Brendan Fraser for a reason. So there's that. Because he almost died? <laughs> That's why you like Good him? Good on you. Good on you, Brendan. No, listen, he really took it serious. I appreciate that. So the production actually had official support from the Moroccan army. And the cast yep. members had kidnapping insurance taken out on them, which director Stephen Summers disclosed to the cast only after the shooting had finished. <laughs> wow. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> wow. And then finally, an actual sophisticated one. Imhotep was actually the name of the architect who developed the first pyramids in ancient Egypt, most notably the Pyramid of Djoser, if that's how you say it pronouncely. Or, pro wow. If you pronounce that correctly. He was actually later to have said to be descended from the gods. He was that good at architecting. Mm. His name actually means one who comes in peace. So, yeah. That's pretty funny, actually. That is pretty funny. So, there's one other small, small, small detail I do want to mention. In the movie, and you got to be, like, very eagle-eyed to see it, Rick O'Connell has a little tattoo on his hand, a very, very, very small marking. And that marking is actually a plot point in the sequel. So... I think it's very interesting that they actually had, even in this movie, they kind of almost maybe had an eye to the sequel. I'm going to be honest. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. yeah. I forget which hand it's on. I think it's the right. It's got a very small tattoo. And also, I mean, we kind of find out it's not really a secret, but you know Evie's boss, the kind of the curator of the museum she works at? Yeah. yeah. We actually see him at the start of the movie in that fight with O'Connell and the French Foreign Legion against the Magi, we actually see him in full Magi gear with mm. Ardeth on top, like riding a horse. He's like there when they're like, oh, do we kill him? And, you know, Ardeth is like, nah, we won't do that. And I think it's interesting because I didn't pick up on this when I first watched the movie, because probably because I was a little shit, but the map of Hominoptera, he like purposely burns it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. that they can't get to it. That's a thing you catch on a rewatch. I yeah, didn't catch that. Oh. Yeah, he purposefully burns because Bonner watched this with me and Bonner's apparently a big fan and pretty knowledgeable about this. Mm. But he um, pointed it out to me because, yeah, he totally as soon as he sees the map, he recognizes it for what it is and he burns it so that they can't find their way to Hominoptera. He's trying to stop it. And he even like dissuades. He tries to dissuade Evie. He's yeah. like, you know, like, don't go anywhere and like, don't try. It's all myth. It's all made up. So yeah. I thought it was pretty cool that he's got that particular kind of character going underneath. And for the record, I kind of feel like Benny was in the wrong profession and he should have been a translator. <laughs> like, yeah. Real talk. Because he knows like how many different languages. He's Hungarian. He curses in Hungarian throughout the movie. And he clearly understands at least Arabic, Hebrew, and maybe one or two other languages. I'm like, bro, you could probably translate because he knows English as well. So... French, French he, too. He does translate. He becomes Imhotep's translator. You know? Oh my God. So he gets paid well. I mean, if he had lived, he would get paid quite well yeah. for it. <laughs> he was too greedy. He was too greedy, bro. He, was he actually probably out. could have made it out okay. Yeah. Just one trip shorter. But it's time for the what would you do? And I'm going to do two things here. But we're going to start with what character do we think, you know, we are most mm. like? So, Nico, we're going to look at Dan real quick. And what okay. character do you think Dan is most like from this movie? Me personally, I'm going with Ardeth, kind of like the strong, more silent type mm. who shows up to help out and actually has a couple of funny quips now and again, but is largely silent. 
I could see him as Ardeth or um, Evie's boss, honestly. Oh, like, okay, I could curator. see you doing some, like, yeah, the curators and doing, like, real sly shit, like, I'm going to burn this on the down low so you don't even think it's me, but I'm looking out for you. You don't even realize. All right, all right, all right, all right. So now, Dan, we're going to take a look at Nico here. Mm. What character do you see Nico being in this movie? I don't know, man. That's tough. I would see him being... Don't take this the wrong way. Oh. Jonathan. Really? I was going to say Evie, yeah. but sure, that's fine too, yeah. I could say Evie too. Yeah, actually, because the thirst for knowledge and the academia side of it. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. See, I could also kind of see Jonathan. The reason why I personally think Jonathan is I feel like Jonathan was just brave enough. Like Jonathan isn't the guy to like go recklessly charging into battle, but if everyone's fighting, he'll fight too. Yeah. And Jonathan knows enough to translate. I mean, he could read, actually yeah. read ancient Egyptian. Yeah. So Jonathan's actually pretty smart and it's kind of hinted at that because when we see the start of the movie, he's drunk and Evie tells him that, you know, you yeah. ruined your career. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, I've never found anything. Please tell me I found something good, even though we stole it. Yeah. And generally, Jonathan actually does some pretty common sense things. He saves the key from the burning boat and then he takes the key back it's a true. second time. The movie literally could not have finished without Jonathan. Yeah, that's fair. So I see that. And lastly, myself. Who do you think I'm most like? Turn up the races meter just a little bit. Let's see. <laughs> who am I? Who am I like? I wasn't going to say fucking Imhotep. Oh, really? Okay, good. Good, good, good. I feel like you're Rick. What? Because you are the kind of brash motherfucker who would do He's some, right. like, if you were caught in a jail cell and there was, like, a really beautiful woman coming up to save He's you, right. you would do some shit, like, pull her in, just, like, kiss her and be like, get me out of here. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way or a chauvinist way, but like he's got a similar vibe as you do. It's funny because I was discussing this with um, Bonner. Bonner said that he actually felt like he was a Jonathan too. I could see yeah. that. Just all the yeah. clips. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. For the record, Nico, you'll be glad to know Bonner said that he thought you could potentially be Benny. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking thanks, my dude. But... No, um, Bonner agreed that he thought I would be Rick. And he said not quite at the start, but I guess towards the middle slash end, he was like, I could see you doing some of that shit. I don't know. That's good. Because I was going to say that, like, at first I thought he was going to tell me I was Ardeth, but actually Bonner thought that Ardeth would be Dan as well, mm. just because, like, the kind of strong, silent kind of character. But I want to ask you guys. So we are on a DOTD, we go back in time, and we're on a DOTD dig in Hobbinoptra, actually. Uh, and Nope, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> we would have all nope the fuck out of there already. <laughs> well, we're there. So we see the other Americans opening up the box, and it's like anyone who opens up this box is like thoroughly fucked. <laughs> would you try and stop them? Yes, Or would you like fuck? just run? I would try to stop uh, them, and then if it if I wasn't successful, I would call up Winston and be like, yo, my guy, we're getting the fuck out of here, bro. <laughs> yeah. Get me on your plane, stat. Now, second step, we just happened to be there in the background. We were recording a podcast in the desert. Oh, shit. And <laughs> In 1926. Yeah, and we kind of see, like, you know, Rick O'Connell and Evie and Jonathan – running away from like the ancient city of Hominoptera and Ardeth runs up. He's like, yo, DOTD, like I know y'all are real. So look, this is the situation. Can you help us stop Imhotep? And you know, where we kind of agree like, yeah, we'll do it. Sure. Why not? Just for the lulz. So how would you stop Imhotep before he kind of absorbed everybody? How would you stop Imhotep? What would be your best moves? Gun. Do we have a, Choice. I mean, I feel like there's only one way to stop them, which is what they did. Yeah. So you wouldn't do anything different? I feel like they didn't really try to stop them from absorbing the people, like, well enough. Like, nobody was really being protected. I probably would have just, yeah, like, true. gone to Petco and gotten a bunch of cats. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I would have carried that cat with me. Like, because they scare him with the cat. And then I don't know what the fuck happens to cats after that. They just like toss it out of the window or some <laughs> shit. I don't know. But like, I would have kept the fuck out of that cat. I'm going to run down the street grabbing all the cats I can get. Pause. Jeez. So. Yes, by their paws. Ah. Ah. Good catch. Ah, yeah. Like the cat. So. I do also want to ask one last thing, which is. Now, let's say, for example, Emotep kidnapped somebody near and dear to you. How about this, Dan? Emotep kidnapped Nico. No. Are we going to hop in that plane with Winston to chase him down? I fully would not expect that. At that point in the movie? Probably not. No. Sorry, oh, Nico. I understand. Earlier, before Emotep became like full on Emotep, I probably would have. But at that point, I. Ah, sorry, bro. It's all cool. Right, all right. It's cool. All right. So before I kind of, you know, check the score on Rotten Tomatoes here, what's your favorite scene in this movie? Dan, what's your favorite, favorite scene in this? Fuck. I don't know. That's hard, man. If you don't know, I can ask Nico real quick. Ask Nico real quick. Nico, real quick. I think my favorite scene is the part where Benny is going back through all the different religions and he's like, you know, he's doing his fucking homework, like being like, oh, this one didn't work, <laughs> this one didn't work, fuck. Like, just because that is something that we talk about on the podcast, you gotta come correct, and he came correct. So, like, shout outs to him. He died, but he did his homework. I think my favorite scene, aside from me being like a total male pig and being like the scene where like, Evie was like, you know, in the kind of nice looking outfit. She mm. came out here looking like chic. But yeah. mm -hmm. aside from that, aside from that, maybe my favorite scene was the one where they're in Cairo and they're trying to find Benny and they find Benny. And then O'Connell picks up a chair and oh, then just yeah, fucking bro. pelts the chair yo, at Benny. That was a good ass <laughs> throw. Like, Great throw. <laughs> it was a solid throw, but it looked so real. I was like, yo, he like fucking yeah. threw the chair at him. Maybe he did shit. I know, considering he almost died, but Dan, time's up. Fuck. What's it going to be? Um, it's going to be multiple scenes, but it's pretty much any time they made the stereotype, American stereotypes. All those like couples, times sprinkled throughout the movie, I thought all of them were funny. <laughs> true, 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 true. So, on Rotten Tomatoes, this movie is rated at a 61% from the critics and a 75% from the audience. So I want to know. I want to know your scores and just brief general thoughts. So who wants to start here? I'll start. I'll start. All right, go ahead. Oh. oh, no, you go ahead. Uh, no, Justin, you go ahead, motherfucker. You never start. Yeah, you never start. Except that no, one right, time. I guess there. I'll start starting now. So... Hard on my sleeve here. I fucking love this movie. And I think it definitely has its flaws. I think, you know, particularly if the movie was made, you know, nowadays, I think there could potentially be some calls for, you know, like some better representation yeah. in the movie. I think there's a couple, we get a couple here and there, you know, the, the legendary white Egyptian <laughs> pops up. But I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I still love this movie. I have a lot of nostalgic value. And I mean, I've always felt a connection to this movie just because when I was a kid, I saw this and it scared the ever loving shit out of me, particularly the scene where Emotep is coming after Evie and he turns into sand and goes through the little mm -hmm. hole in her door. That same night, I remember like I was staying in my aunt's house and I was like staring at my door, expecting like sand to start coming from the door. So I loved this movie. I think it's amazing. It does have flaws. I think first off, the two, two hour runtime is a little long. A lot happens in the movie, so I'm not gonna grade it too harshly. And there's already some cuts I think they did make actually to the theatrical version versus the mm -hmm. version that I saw. But all in all, to me, it's just super fucking fun. It's one of those, just turn your brain off a little bit and go for the ride. I. I just love this movie a lot, probably too much. And I also should declare my undying love for Rachel Weisz as well. She's amazing. And she also went on to do a lot of really cool movies. So I'm going to give this one an 88 from me. Now it's your turn. 
after you, motherfucker. All right, all right, all right. Bitch. I echo a lot of Justin's thoughts. I think this movie is just a blast. I love it. It really does kind of remind me of Indiana Jones, and I like Indiana Jones a lot. So this was a little bit more of a, a modern-day Indiana Jones, I think. Modern day being 20 years ago at this point, but the fuck? I still, I love it, man. I love it. Great blend of adventure, comedy, a little bit of romance, a little bit of horror. I love it. I'm going to give it an 80, 86. All right, Nico. All right. So I really dig this movie and hot take. I actually think this is better than Indiana Jones. Fight me. <laughs> fight me. Fucking fireball here at the okay. end there. Okay. I, yeah. fair, fair enough. I, I'm not going to fight you on that. That's fair. That's yeah. Fair. No. I enjoy for the same reasons y'all do. I also have a particular soft spot because when I was younger, I was really into like Egyptology and all that shit too. So it is nostalgic for similar reasons. Not the exact same, but similar reasons. So I am going to rate this one an 85 right down the middle. Mm-hmm. Between the two of you. Nope. No, no it wasn't. 84, 86, wasn't it? Did no. I fuck that up somehow? You gave it an 88. Son of a bitch, I thought I gave it an 86. I can't math. Are you still going to keep it at the 85? Yeah, I'm going to keep it at 85. Fair <laughs> All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. And yeah, I mean, so first off, will we recommend this one? It's a yes for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to lead here. I'm going to say that I do really consider this to get the Golden Seal of approval from me. I don't. I'm sorry. Okay, good. When I think about what this podcast is and like the content of the other movies that we put on here, I don't think it's like a cut above. I think it's a really great movie, but I don't think it's a cut above. Hmm. Dan, it seems like you kind of lucked out here a little bit, sir. I did. I did. So not I'm having, not, not yeah, having to do I'm that. I'm not going to answer that question because that's a hard one. So I, I don't have to answer it anymore. All right. Any last thoughts before we bring this one to a cease? I recall the sequel being really, really good as well. It is pretty good. It is pretty good. I don't think I ever saw any of the sequels, actually. I saw the sort of pseudo spinoff, Scorpion King with The Rock, but I never I actually saw, like... Stand alone! <laughs> I never Sorry. actually saw the direct sequels to this one. Cool. It sounds like that's about it for us here. Don't open that door. So... I guess, you know, don't. Don't open that sarcophagus. <laughs> well, it's funny because there's a scene at the start where O'Connell's yelling to Benny, don't close that door. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I got to take the opposite view here. If you happen to find an ancient sarcophagus that might be cursed, don't open that door. <laughs> if you're going to a place that seems like it's potentially haunted, just don't open that door. And last but not least, and I know this is kind of off-brand, but if the box literally says, open this and fucking die, (laughs) don't open that shit. (laughs) Just fucking don't. And of course it was the Americans, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. (laughs) But yeah, that's it from your your boys, Nico, Dan, and Jess. If you like The Mummy, if you like us, or if you feel the opposite and you hate us, drop us a line. We're on Twitter and Instagram at DOTD Horror. Send us hate mail. <laughs> Make us go to therapy. Not if you hate the mummy. If you hate us. <laughs> if you hate <laughs> us, yeah. Give us real direct personal shit. Make us cry. Find us on Facebook. Don't open that door. But yeah, that's been it from us. Find me on Facebook. Nico, find me on Facebook. <laughs> Take care of one another, and as always, dear listener, don't open that door. Bye.